Good afternoon, everybody. It is Sunday, September 29th, 2024. And today I am going to read you the Canton Police Department investigative, investigative, sorry, report. Sometimes I say it different. Um, regarding the incident on July 19th, 2022, cold case investigation. Oh goodness, this is Kevin Albert. All right, this is a thorough, thorough investigation. Y'all get ready. This is a 200 page file and less than 12 pages regarding, well, I want to say probably less than four pages actually regarding anything relevant. I mean, you know, they, they took the time to, let's see how I put it. They took the time to um, attach transcripts of Proctor's internal interview, but that was, uh, the records on that remained uh, confidential, which, why? I mean, those are already said. I don't see how those records need to remain confidential, but they say they do. And then we're going to have texted messages between Albert and Proctor on July 18th, 19th, and 20th provided by the U.S. Attorney's Office. And those records as well re remain confidential, even though they've been stated in open court. And uh, we have credit card, debit card information. Those records remain confidential as well. Possession of firearms while under the influence. That's an exhibit. A fraudulent claim of hours. That's an exhibit. District attorney's jurisdiction is an exhibit. Order from Chief Helena Rafferty to Albert for credit card records. I'm going backwards, by the way, which that's amazing that Chief Rafferty did anything, right? I mean, she never does anything. Then we have relevant portions of testimony, <laughs> video testimony of Proctor during the Karen Reed trial, which is Exhibit 9. But they took up a whole lot of space by... Um, giving us rules and regulations of camp police department policies and procedures internal affairs union contract attendance records july 17th to july 23rd order from chief rafferty to albert for communications between albert and proctor dated july 8th preservation order from chief rafferty man her name is all over this case i mean she is all she's all in right she is busy woman would have been nice if she would have been overseeing uh, a situation with Officer John O'Keefe as well. But the interesting thing here is how long it took because, you know, I mean, when you're just printing out documents and information that, uh, you know, we've got letters from Chief Rafferty, we've got letters from Chief Rafferty, and we've got orders from Chief Rafferty. But, you know, the attendance records take up... <laughs> 90% is all blacked out. I'm not even going to bother those. But the, the contract, union contract, policy and procedures, internal affairs, rules and regulations of the camp police department. Those are all just a waste. But it looks like a thorough investigation when you read that it's got 200 pages, right? Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just start off a little bit here. Confidential draft investigatory findings submitted to the town of Canton on September 10th, 2024 by attorney Terrence M. Delahante on behalf of law offices of Terrence M. Delahante. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but we're just guessing. Logistical information on or about June 15th, 2024, Chief Helena Rafferty. Let me let me just highlight because you know she don't she, she doesn't get involved much, does she? Of the Canton 
Police Department engaged my services to investigate an incident that was highlighted during the Karen Reed trial. The investigation concerns an issue involving Detective Kevin Albert, Albert, of the Canton Police Department Detective Unit related to an incident that occurred in July 2022. The investigation began on June 17, 2024 and continued through the end of August 2024. The primary focus of the investigation is to determine whether Albert misplaced or lost his service firearm and badge during a cold case investigation in the town of Sandwich. So this is really good because I want to know. I want to know. Scope of the investigation services. The scope of the investigation involves a fact-finding review of an incident that occurred in July 2022, during which Albert and Proctor Albert and Trooper Michael Proctor traveled to Sandwich, Mass. to conduct interviews related to a cold case. The investigation aims to determine if Albert misplaced or lost his firearm and badge during the investigation or the loss of misplacement was properly reported through the chain of command or if any policies or procedures were... Uh, violated. <laughs> wow. Were anything violated? Well, I'm just going to guess that they're going to have no findings on it. I'm just guessing, right? Additionally, the investigation will provide recommendations based on the current trends and best practices in policy as they relate to any issues identified. So we're going to skip reading down everything that they put in here. Um, <laughs> I'm not even going to read all of it because, I mean, you know, some of it's uh, policy and procedures or something like last time done was 2000. Weird. Interviews. This is this. I love this, right? Interviews. The interviews of all witnesses in this case were coordinated by the investigator. They began on July 8th, 2024 through August 14th, 2024. Each interview was scheduled in one to two hour sessions. The investigator interviewed Canton Police Department officials at varying ranks with first or secondhand knowledge of the cold case investigations being conducted by Proctor and Albert. First or second-hand knowledge of the cold case investigations being conducted by Proctor and Albert. Sorry, the way I read it didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> oh, goodness. All town of Canton employees who were interviewed were informed that the investigation, the investigator was hired to perform an independent, neutral, and non-biased fact-finding investigation. The investigator explained to each person interviewed that the investigator is a mass licensed attorney at law and that he does not represent the town of Canton, the Canton Police Department, or any member of the community or police force, and that the investigator was hired solely as an independent, non-biased fact finder. I wonder who picked him out, though. Who, who, who picked this person out? I'm assuming Rafferty. So, I mean, we're not going to know anything about him, right? Because, I mean, if Rafferty says anything, who's going to believe her anyway at this point? I like this. All interviews were conducted in person by attorney Terrence M. Delahante, portions of this report are summarized, or are summaries, jeez, of the interviews and not verbatim transcripts. So that's important because, you know, people go out and say, well, they said, but well, he's telling you right now that in here there is no verbatim. I like this portion as well because we just saw all interviews were conducted in person. We're going to start with the interview of attorney David Yannetti, 
via phone and email. I guess that's in person, right? On July 8, 2024, this investigator contacted attorney David Yanetti via email and phone to obtain any pertinent information relevant to the investigation that was not subject to a protective order. Attorney Yanetti responded and indicated that he believed his team did not possess any additional information beyond what had already been presented in court or the text messages held by the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Mass. These text messages had already been requested directly from the United States Attorney's Office. It was a long interview. Interview of Lieutenant Paul Gallagher. The investigator scheduled an interview with Lieutenant Paul Gallagher for July 31st at 11 a.m. at Canton Town Hall, room 208. At the start of the interview, Gallagher was informed that it would be recorded as required to the police peace officer standards and training commissions, P POST is the nickname, acronym, and he consented to the recording. Background. We're going to jump right into his background. According to Gallagher, he was hired as a permanent police officer by the Canton Department, Canton Police Department on April 1st, 1992 and became full-time officer in 1994. He was promoted to detective in 2000 and in 2005 was assigned to the DEA Drug Task Force where he served for 13 years. Wow, that's kind of weird. Gallagher was promoted to sergeant in 2017 and detective sergeant in 2018 after he had left the DEA task force. In August 2021, he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant and part of his responsibilities included hiring, internal affairs, background checks, and overseeing the detectives and various ships. Whoa. Cold case assignment. Gallagher confirmed that in July 2022, he was the lieutenant in charge of the detective unit. He acknowledged that Albert was assigned to a cold case investigation in September 2021. Due to the ongoing nature of the investigation, specific details were not discussed and a case was referred to generically as a cold case. Gallagher explained that the case was initiated when a citizen submitted newspaper articles to the deputy chief who then forwarded them to Gallagher for further investigation. Since the case fell under district attorney's office jurisdiction, Proctor was assigned through the district attorney's office. Conflict checking. The investigator asked if the department conducts conflict checks before assigning cases to the detectives. Gallagher explained that the detectives sometimes self-report conflicts and in other cases the department intervenes to prevent employees from working on certain cases due to a conflict. He noted that as a small town Canton had many personal connections which can often benefit investigators. Y'all, I am so sorry. I am sitting here. Let me show you my screen. I apologize. I am just reading right along. So we've <laughs> mercy. I could be just reading anything. Okay. My apologies. I'm sitting here showing y'all stuff and it's not even there. So here is the report. Like that big first page. All right, I do apologize that I wasn't paying attention. So page one, two, page three, and we're on page four. 
I believe. Yes, we just did conflict checking, which I found. Uh, <laughs> I found amazing. Okay. All right, overtime procedures. Gallagher explained the overtime obligation and the balance between flex time and overtime within the detective unit. He noted that there is a three hour minimum for overtime, meaning if a day shift officer is required to stay beyond their shift for an investigation, they are compensated for at least three hours. Detectives must obtain approval for overtime in advance unless they are already on duty and required to stay longer due to assisting the patrol division or responding to a patrol division request. Hmm. Breaks. Oh, let me see. Overtime division request. Regarding Albert's overtime for the trip to Sandwich, Gallagher clarifies that the detectives enter their own overtime into the system and include comments in the attendance roster, noting the case name or number to indicate the reason. Gallagher confirmed that Albert is known for diligently requesting overtime approval in advance. So Albert he's just he's just always doing the right thing because he he requests his overtime in advance while gallagher does not specifically recall the july 19 2022 overtime request he is confident that albert followed the proper procedure and requested permission for the assignment mm -hmm breaks. Gallagher was asked about lunch breaks for detectives and whether there is a set time limit for them. He confirmed that lunch and dinner breaks are provided, typically lasting 30 minutes for patrol officers. Detectives, however, usually have more flexible breaks, often eating quickly and returning to work promptly. Gallagher emphasized that the extended breaks beyond an hour are not customary and would exceed department expectations. He also stated that consuming alcohol drinks during breaks is strictly prohibited by the rules, regulations, and practices of the Canton Police Department. Badging gun. Gallagher was asked whether Albert had reported misplacing or losing his badge. He stated that he had not received any such reports from Albert and was unaware until recently of the discussion about the badge being misplaced. When asked if he would consider a badge left in another officer's unmarked cruiser as lost or misplaced, Gallagher explained that he would not. He noted that in his experience, officers use badge belt clips, often remove them from the comfort for their comfort when seated, and he himself frequently removes his belt clip while driving, considering it neither lost nor misplaced. Yeah, I see where this is going already. Gallagher was also asked if he had any knowledge of Albert allegedly misplacing a firearm, he stated that he was not aware of such an incident. Additionally, Gallagher mentioned that he does not use social media and had not discussed the matter with anyone other than the chief. Well, we all know that we don't believe Gallagher, so... That's kind of interesting. They just put all their faith in the fact he's answering the questions, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to interview Gallagher to find out if uh, Kevin Albert could have done the things he's accused of. 
that's basically what the investigation boils down to. From what we've seen, or what you will see, let's see. Um, interview of Detective Albert. Oh, that. so that was it on, uh, we're, we're finished with Gallagher. Wow. So, um, Gallagher, let's see, quarter one. So we started on page three with the interview of Gallagher. And here we go down to here. This is a footnote. Here's page four. And here is, so not very much, right? But that's, that's Albert's, uh, I mean, Gallagher's, that's Gallagher's. All right. Interview of Detective Albert. In communication with union attorney Jennifer Smith of San, Sanduli, Grace PC, and union attorney Peter, whatever, of Anderson, Goldman, Tobin, and whatever. An interview with Albert was conducted on August 14th at 1.30 p.m. Please note that any delay in scheduling the interview was outside the control of the town and Albert. Please note that any delay in scheduling the interview was outside the control of the town or Albert. Okay. Well, Albert shouldn't have had any reason that he couldn't have just gone any single day that they called him. Why is that? Oh, because he was on a paid, paid uh, leave while they investigated. So, you know, he could have been summoned at any time. But wow, didn't even interview Albert until August 14th, 2024. That's interesting. All right. The interview was conducted at Canton Town Hall as scheduled. At the start of the interview, both attorney Pas Pasca I don't even know, <laughs> and Albert were informed that the interview would be recorded as required by the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission's post. Both attorney and Albert consented to the recording. Background information. Albert provided the following background information about his employment with the Canton Police Department. He was hired as a firefighter, as, as a firefighter. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. It's really hard for me to keep my focus at the moment. I don't, I don't. He was hired as a police officer in 2005 and served in a school resource officer role. Approximately five years ago, he was promoted to detective. Albert confirmed that he has had no disciplinary issues or complaints filed with Post during his tenure. They like to say that, right? They like to say how they're good and clean, they smell like a rose, because nobody has caught them yet. He is current with all in-service training and is certified by Post as a police officer. Woohoo! He is certified, y'all. <laughs> he is currently with all in service training and is certified by post as a police officer. Albert was in plain clothes and had his badge and firearm with him when he entered Proctor's Cruiser. On July 19th, 2022, cold case assignment. Albert explained that Gallagher assigned him to the cold case investigation on or about September or October of 2021. He believed that the relative of, a vic of the victim contacted Canton police, prompting Gallagher to ask him to investigate. Albert and Proctor had been conducting interviews sporadically throughout the year when they identified a person of interest 
They scheduled an interview with that individual in Sandwich on July 19th of 2022. Making me hungry. Travel and interview details. Travel arrangements. On July 18th, 2022, the day before the trip to Sandwich, Albert and Proctor communicated by text. During that conversation, it was decided that Proctor would drive them to Sandwich on July 19th, 2022. When asked about his comment, soak up the overtime, Albert explained it was a tongue-in-cheek joke amplifying that they would stop for dinner since they would be out for an extended period. So when asked about the comment, soak up the overtime, Albert explained it was a tongue-in-cheek joke, implying that they would stop for dinner since they would be out for an extended period. Right, right. Overtime practices. Albert confirmed the overtime practices of Canton Police Department as discussed during Gallagher's interview. Officers receive a minimum of three hours pay for overtime worked, and then they are compensated on an hour-for-hour -hour basis thereafter. Additionally, if an officer works into the next hour, they are paid for the entire hour, not just the fractional part. The trip details. Albert stated that he drove to work on July 19th, worked the day shift, typically from 745 to 345, after which he went on overtime. He recalled that Proctor picked him up at the Canton Police Department around 440, 445. The drive to Sandwich took approximately one hour and 20 minutes with no stops made. The interview and sandwich lasted approximately one hour to one and a half hours. They attempted to locate another individual, but were unsuccessful. Return trip to dinner. Dinner location. On the return trip to Canton, Albert and Proctor stopped at Flanders Field in Hanover. Albert could not recall his exact order, but believed it was likely a burger or chicken and an appetizer. When asked about an alcoholic beverage, Albert said he did not specifically recall ordering a beer, but he acknowledged it was certainly possible. He said he would take full responsibility for ordering one to two beers. Okay. But he didn't recall what kind they were. You know, they had to ask that because of Lally. Uh, Lally's keeping a tally of who drinks what in the town. I'm not sure why, but it's majorly important to him. Dinner was estimated to take about an hour, and the drive from Sandwich to Hanover was estimated at 45 minutes to an hour. Payment. Albert did not remember who paid for the dinner, but stated that they typically split the bill, and he did not request reimbursement from the town of Canton for the dinner. Not sure how he's going to remember that or if he was able to pull up records. Badge and firearm handling. During dinner, Albert explained that he usually removes both his badge and firearm during dinner because they're cumbersome. He stated that Proctor's vehicle was equipped with a safe and a locking glove box. Albert stated the firearm was locked in the glove box directly in front of him and that he, play, he believed he placed the badge flipped over so it's not visible in the console. Missing badge. Albert realized that his badge was left in Proctor's cruiser the following day when Proctor texted him about it. Albert confirmed that he did not report the missing badge as he was informed prior to going to work that morning that it was indeed in the vehicle. All righty, return to Canton. Albert estimated the drive from Hanover to Canton took 40 to 45 minutes. He was dropped off at the Canton police station between 1010 and 1030 p.m. Albert confirmed he took his gun when he was dropped off at the Canton police station and explained that a text message about leaving his gun was a joke. 
you know, you give these people just a little bit of time to think and they can come up with just all kinds of plausible excuses, so they think. But disprove it, I guess. Upon returning home, Albert watched television and had a couple of IPAs describing a couple as about two or three drinks. IPAs. Must be drinking or eating or something. Oh, goodness, y'all. I'm, I'm going to have to get up for a second here. This keeps up. Let's see. So he remembered returning home and watching television and having a couple of drinks. Communications with Proctor. According to Albert, his last communication with Proctor was in July of 2023. He has not discussed this investigation with any other than his wife, legal counsel, and union representative. Albert also confirmed Proctor had never been to his house. That's important because Albert said, Supplemental interview of Detective Albert. <clears throat> On August the 29th, 2024, attorney Peter whatever contacted me regarding the financial records I had requested at the end of Albert's initial interview. Specifically, we discussed the debit and or credit card statements pertinent to the investigation. We agreed that it was necessary to bring Albert back in to explain the charges made and a credit card, July 19th, 2022. The supplemental interview with Albert took place on September the 4th. During this interview, Albert noted that while retrieving and reviewing the requested statements, he realized that he and Proctor had made two stops after their initial interview in Sandwich. So here's a case where he was he was questioned. He knew he was going to be questioned. He didn't he didn't brush up on anything to remember anything specific. But when they asked for his credit and debit card receipts, um well he kind of remembered that they actually stop someplace else. Don't you find that convenient? I do. Can you tell that I don't believe a single word? I don't. I think this is the biggest bunch of bull malarkey I've ever seen, but who am I? Um, all right, the first stop. Now we've got the correct we're going to assume we have the correct information. The first stop was the Treehouse Brewery Company in Sandwich. Two charges, $34 and $70.80. Albert stated that the $34 transaction was for alcoholic beverages consumed on the premises, including tip and tax. And he believes the other two alcoholic drinks ordered. Oh, he believes there were two other alcoholic drinks ordered. The $70.80 transaction was for beverages purchased to go. So you're out working a cold case. You stop and you get you a couple of beverages, which you consume. And then you ordered beverages to go. Also including tax. These beverages were intended for a trip to New Hampshire a few days later. Boy, they sure did get that excuse out there, didn't they? They got that excuse out there. Albert estimated that they spent no more than 30 minutes at Treehouse Brewing Company which he thought closed around 7.30 or 8 p.m. 
This information was corroborated by Treehouse Brewing Company's website, which states that they close at 8 p.m. on Tuesdays, with the last order for drafts being 30 minutes before closing. So, because the website says it, they can confirm it. Investigation of Treehouse Brewing Company on September 4th, 2024, I visited Treehouse Brewing Company in Sandwich and spoke with the on-duty manager. I inquired if she could provide an itemized receipt for specific transactions from July 2022. While well, attempted to access the transaction, but could not retrieve records beyond one year. She referred me to her superior, Andrew Late. I guess it's Late whom I contacted by email. As of the writing of this report, I have not received a response from late regarding the itemized receipt for the Alberts transactions. The second stop was at Flanders Field, Hanover, Mass. The charge was $68.71. This stop on the back from Sandwich was discussed during Albert's initial interview and aligns with the information he previously provided. The charge was for an order consisting of an appetizer, entree, two alcoholic drinks, tax, and gratuity. I found Albert's statement during both interviews to be forthcoming, truthful, and reasonable. Finding of fact. The below facts are drawn from the records provided in the interviews conducted. It should be noted that some records provided for the purpose of this investigation were done so in confidence. Albert was hired by the Canton Police Department in 2005, served as a school resource officer, and then was pronounced to de promoted to detective approximately five years ago. Albert was supervised by Gallagher. The Deputy Chief of Canton Police Department received some correspondence about a cold case from 1980. The correspondence requested further investigation of the matter. The information was forwarded to Gallagher. In September of, or October of 2021, Gallagher assigned Albert to the old case investigation. Albert reached out to the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office to request that someone be assigned to the investigation, consistent with Chapter 38, 4 of the Mass General Laws. Since the fall of 2021, Albert and Proctor intermediately conducted interviews and research related to the cold case. On July 18, 2022, Albert and Proctor exchanged text messages about traveling to Sandwich, Mass. to conduct an interview for the cold case. They agreed to travel to Sandwich on July 19, 2022, around 5 p.m. In the July 18, 2022 text message, Proctor mentioned knowing a good place in Hanover for dinner. On July 19, 2022, Proctor picked up Albert at the Canton Police Station at approximately 4.40 p.m. Proctor drove himself and Albert to Sandwich, Mass. No stops were made between the Canton Police Department and Sandwich, Mass. All right. The travel time to Sandwich was approximately one hour to one and a half hours. The interview that was conducted in Sandwich lasted approximately one to one and a half hours. If the interview, after the interview, Trooper Proctor and Albert stopped at the Treehouse Brewing Company in Sandwich, Mass. Albert made two transactions at the uh, Treehouse Brewing Company, one for $34 and the other for $70.80. The $34 was for alcohol exhumed on the premises of the Treehouse Brewing Company. 
The charge for the seventy dollars and eighty cents was for four, four to five four packs of IPA alcoholic beverages that was purchased to take home. Okay then. After the treehouse stop, Proctor and Albert drove back to Canton, Mass. They stopped for dinner at Flandersfield in Hanover, Mass. They traveled from Sandwich, Mass to Hanover. It's about 45 minutes. Before entering Flandersfield for dinner, Albert removed his badge and placed it face down in the console area and secured his firearm in the glove box. All right. They split. They spent uh, approximately an hour in the restaurant for dinner. Albert ordered an appetizer, entree, and one or two beers. Albert made a credit card transaction at Flanders Field in the amount of sixty-eight dollars seventy-one cents. After leaving Flanders Field, they returned to Canton Police Department, where Albert was dropped off. Albert did not retrieve his badge from Proctor's cruiser. Albert did retrieve his firearm from the glove box of, Proctor cru of Proctor's cruiser. Albert did receive his four to five four packs of IPA from Pro Proctor's cruiser. Albert did drive home from the Canton Police Department. All right. When Albert arrived home approximately 10.30 p.m. and subsequently had more beers while watching television. So he, he remembers that. On July 20th, 2022, Albert and Proctor exchanged additional text messages. Proctor texted, found your badge in my cruiser this morning. I can leave it in my locker at the gym, drop it off at your station, or leave it in my mailbox. Wow. Albert responds, my mailbox, did I take my gun? Followed by a wincing face emoji. Proctor responded with ha ha, followed by, what's your address? I will drop it off after the gym. Proctor delivered the badge to Albert at the Canton Police Department. On July 20th, 2022, Albert texted Proctor a picture of two alcoholic drinks with the message, it's bad. I was hungover for sure today. Analysis. The incident involves various rules and regulations. To discuss them comprehensively, I will discuss each rule and regulation individually under separate subtitles. This approach is intended to provide clarity for the reader. The subsection will be organized as follows. Criminal contact, possession or use of alcohol, conduct and becoming an officer, Items of identification and care and security of firearms based on all evidence and reasonable inferences drawn therefrom and giving their appropriate weight thereto of information known at the time of the drafting of this report. The following findings or conclusions are made based on the preponderance of the evidence. As a part of my responsibilities, I must determine whether Albert violated the Canton Police Department rules and regulations by engaging in criminal conduct according to Rule 11.12, Criminal Conduct. Okay. I want to read this in case I missed it or more so just because I want to say it again based on all the evidence 
and reasonable inferences drawn therefrom and giving the appropriate weight thereto of information known at the time of drafting this report, the following findings and conclusions are made based on the preponderance of the evidence. Okay. All right. So this, this we've 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 read we've 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 read what what they investigated. Now, oh my gosh, I'm gonna read this again. Criminal conduct. As part of my responsibilities, I must determine whether Albert violated the Canton Police Department of Rules and Regulations by engaging in criminal conduct according to Rule 11.12 criminal conduct. Officers shall not commit any motor vehicle or criminal act, felony or misdemeanor, or violate the regulatory or criminal laws or statutes of the United States or of any state or local jurisdictions by law ordinance, whether on or off duty. Note. An officer may be guilty of violating this rule regardless of the outcome of any criminal court case. Convictions for the violation of any law is prima facie evidence of a violation of this rule. However, even in the absence of a conviction, which requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt, any officer may still be disciplined under this rule for the conduct that was involved since a preponderance of the evidence is the quantity of proof required in such cases. Administrative reviews and resulting discipline adhere to a less stringent evidentiary standard than criminal court proceedings. For evaluating whether Albert's actions violate Rule 11.12, the relevant standard is the preponderance of the evidence. In this investigation, I have examined two potential criminal offenses related to the cold case investigation in Sandwich, Mass. Possession of a firearm while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Fraudulent claim of ours. Okay. Well. Hmm. Position of a firearm while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Is that GI or G GL? Chapter 269, 10H. Under this criminal code, a person violates the law and consequently the Canton Police Department rules if they carry or control over a loaded firearm while under the influence of intoxicating substances. Right. I want to say 95% of your department does this. But y'all think you're above the law. So, including alcohol, marijuana, narcotic drugs, depressants, stimulants, or toxic fumes, as defined in the relevant statutes, the penalty for this offense can be up to a fine up to $5,000, imprisonment in house of correction for up to two in one half years, or both. But even though his message said he was so hungover, and we both know he most likely was so hungover, wow. The term under the influence of alcohol refers to the consumption of alcohol to a degree that impairs a person's ability to safely carry or control a loaded firearm. In this case, relevant evidence includes Albert's statements during his internal affairs interview and a text message she sent to Proctor, which reads, it's bad. I was hung over for sure today. During the internal affairs interview, Albert did not specifically recall ordering a beer at Flounders Field, but acknowledged the possibility. He stated he would take full responsibility for having ordered one 
or two beers. Although he could not recall the type, recall he couldn't recall the specific types. In the supplemental interview, Albert stated he probably ordered two drinks at the treehouse. Additionally, statements from Proctor during his state police internal interview suggest that Albert likely consumed two beers during that dinner. It's also reasonable to conclude that Albert had consumed at least one IPA and no more than two IPAs at the treehouse. You don't say. It's reasonable to conclude that. I'd say it's reasonable to conclude that he had more than that myself. Given the dinner lasted one hour and they spent no more than 30 minutes at the treehouse, it's reasonable. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Oh, I see. We're combining the two places, I guess, because they ate at Flanders. Given the dinner lasted one hour, so I'm assuming that's Flanders, and they spent no more than 30 minutes at the treehouse, it's reasonable to conclude that Albert did not consume excessive alcohol. That would have made him intoxicated while armed. All right. Uh huh. Albert clarified that his text message, I was hungover for sure today, referred to his overall fatigue from working a 16-hour shift the previous day, consuming drinks at the treehouse and Flanders Field after the interview and consuming additional drinks at home. He explained the combination of these factors made him feel not, made him feel not feel 100% the next morning. Okay, let's read it again since I sounded kind of funny because, you know, <laughs> At my age, you hear all kind of excuses. You know what they say about excuses. I mean, especially since him and Proctor weren't buddies. And especially since they only worked together on that one case. Why would he be joking around with him in this manner? So anyway, that's just, you know, I mean, it, it's really difficult when you can't tell if um, these officers are joking, serious, on a case, not on a case, you know, they just uh, do what they want, say what they want. That, that's just my observation. And uh, I say bullshit, but all right. I'm going to read it one more time. Albert clarified that his text message, I was hung over for sure today, referred to his overall fatigue from working a 16-hour shift the previous day. I've worked 16-hour days before. Consuming drinks at the treehouse in Flanders Field after the interview and consuming additional drinks at home, he explained that the combination of these factors made him feel made him not feel 100% the next morning. Right. I wonder if y'all take this from your suspects at all. Because I'm going to say that, you know, most, most police seem to have common sense, a way to think, you know, so they can call out BS when it happens. But those of us that aren't breaking the law, that do have common sense and that watch this with flabbergasted emotions, no, our thought process is off, right? Based on the information available, including the number of drinks consumed, the travel time between the establishments, food intake, and Albert's tolerance for alcohol, there is no evidence suggesting that Albert was under the influence of alcohol to the extent that would violate the Canton Police Department rules regarding criminal conduct. Hmm. 
I have to read that again. Based on the information available, including the number of drinks consumed, the travel time between establishments, food intake, and Albert's tolerance for alcohol, there's no evidence suggesting that Albert was under the influence of alcohol to the extent that would violate the Canton Police Department's rules regarding criminal conduct. I'm just wondering if, if it were just a, a regular commoner, would they been found guilty? Because the way the Camp Police Department works, I, I, I would say they would. All right, fraudulent claim of hours. In response to police reform, Mass enacted the fraudulent claim of hours statute, which states, a law enforcement officer, as defined in Section 1, of Chapter 6E, who knowingly submits a false or fraudulent claim of hours worked for payment to a state agency, city, town, or any relevant authority, and receives payment for such a claim or knowingly makes uses or causes to be made or used a false record or statement related to such a claim, shall be punished by a fine three times the amount of the fraudulent wages paid or by imprisonment for up to two years. This also applies to anyone who conspires to commit a violation of this section. This portion of the investigation was prompted by a text message from Albert to Proctor on July 18th, 2022, in which Albert wrote, Soak up the overtime, following a discussion about stopping for dinner. Albert later stated that this was intended as a tongue-in-cheek joke and was simply referring to their dinner stop. I, you know, I worked a job once that I had a lot of overtime. I didn't want the overtime. It's dang good money for me, but I'd rather just do the 40 hours. And we made jokes about OT. But I don't get this soak up for overtime following a discussion about stopping for dinner. Albert later stated that this was intended as a tongue in cheek joke and was simply referring to their dinner stop. So I don't get that because are they on the clock while they're at the, do, 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 do law enforcement get their meals on the clock or are they supposed to subtract out? Because if they were on the clock, then he was drinking while on the clock. If they're not paid for the dinner, then he didn't drink on duty, but he did drink. And then was paid for the travel time. So, you know... And the thing is, we know this isn't the first time. These people do this all the time. It's just this happened to get, you know, they they spoke to Proctor, who, I mean, heaven only knows. Proctor doesn't know how to keep a secret from anybody. I don't see how he's been a cop as long as he has or a trooper. All right. So after all of this, we have the timeline analysis, the timeline provided by Albert. during his internal affairs interview, was cross-checked with Google Maps data from August 20th, 2024, 
Although this data was from two years after the incident, it helps verify the reasonableness of the timeline. Travel from Canton to Sandwich, approximately one hour, 20 minutes. Interview in Sandwich, approximately one to one and a half hours. Stop at Treehouse, approximately 30 minutes. Drive to Flandersfield in Hanover, estimated 45 minutes to one hour. Dinner at Flanders for one hour. Drive from Hanover to Canton Police Department, 40 to 45 minutes. And dropped off at approximately 10.20 p.m. Dinner break. Gallagher's interview confirmed that taking a dinner break during an investigation is reasonable and that an hour for dinner at a restaurant aligns with departmental norms. Given his context and the cooperation of Albert's timeline with messages and other provided information, it does not appear that Albert violated the Canton Police Department rules regarding fraudulent claims of hours worked. Note on timeline. The timeline was verified using Google Maps, which although not from the exact date, provides a reasonable approx approximation. Albert's times did not significantly deviate from the plausible range. For instance, Google Maps indicated to travel from Canton to Sandwich of one hour and six minutes, while Albert estimated one to one and a half hours. Proctor's AVL and cell phone location data was requested, but it was not available for this verification. Overtime. Albert reported seven hours of overtime, 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. Given the practice within the police department of paying three hours minimum for overtime and hourly payment thereafter without paying fractional hours, seven hours of compensation is reasonable based on the timeline set above. Based on this information available, I did not find evidence that Albert submitted a fraudulent claim of hours worked. Therefore, he did not violate the criminal conduct rule of the Canton Police Department. Possession or use of alcohol. Rule 14.6 of the Canton Police Department Rules Regulation states, officers shall not possess and or use alcohol on duty other than in an authorized duty capacity. Officers shall not report to duty or be on duty while under the influence of intoxicating liquor or with an odor of alcoholic beverage on their breath. To determine if this policy was violated, I reviewed Albert's interview text message between Proctor and Albert and Proctor's internal affairs interview, Albert inter Albert's internal interview. Albert did not specifically recall ordering a beer, but stated it was certainly possible. He also stated that he would take full responsibility for ordering one or two beers, but he did not recall what kind they were. Proctor State Police internal interview, Proctor stated during his interview, he had one or two beers. Based on the information available, I do find by the preponderance of the evidence that Albert used alcohol on duty without authorization in a violation of rule and regulation. Based on the information available, I do find by the preponderance of the evidence that Albert used alcohol on duty without authorization in violation of this rule and regulation. Conduct unbecoming an officer. 
Rule 402 of the Canton Police Department Rules and Regulations states in pertinent part, officers shall not commit any specific act or acts of improper, unlawful, disorderly, or in, in temperate, intemperate conduct, conduct, <laughs> conduct, oh. whether on or off duty, which reflects discredit or reflects unfavorably upon the officer, upon other officers, or upon the police department, officers shall conduct themselves at all times, both on and off duty, in such a manner as to reflect most favorably on department and its members. The evidence viewed and examined certainly indicates that Albert ordered and drank two beers at dinner, violating Rule 14.6, Possession or Use of Alcohol. The violation was improper and reflected unfavorably on Albert, members of the Canton Police Department, and the Canton Police Department. Based on the available evidence, I do find by the preponderance of the evidence that Albert's conduct was unbecoming an officer as he ordered and drank alcohol on duty without authorization in violation of this rule and regulation. So if they would have said you're allowed to have a beer on your way, that would have been okay, I'm guessing. No. I mean, even if somebody authorized that you could have a beer while you're on the, you know, you're, no. Items of identification. Badge. During the Karen Reed trial, Proctor testified that he texted Albert on July 20th, 2022, saying, found your badge in my cruiser this morning. This testimony raised the question of whether Albert violated Rule 12.12 .12 concerning items of identification. Oh, goodness. Rule 12.12 .12 states, Officers shall be responsible for the items of identification issued to them as an officer of the department, including but not limited to police badge any numbered hat, badge, or nameplate, and the police identification card. They shall not permit any other person to borrow or use the items of identification issued to them by the department. Any, such, any loss of such items shall be reported immediately by the officers to the chief of police together with a written report of circumstances leading to such a loss. But rules don't apply to you, right? Or you were too drunk to even know that you lost your badge. I don't know. Albert's explanation. Albert stated during his interview that he removed the badge belt clip from his belt, placed it face down in the console of Proctor's vehicle while he went into Flanders Field Restaurant. He forgot to retrieve it when he was dropped off. Amazing what they can remember if they need to, you know, otherwise they don't remember something. But he remembered that he, he took the badge belt clip from his belt and placed it face down on the console. He remembers that. Albert's badge remained in a state police cruiser overnight and he immediately had it returned to him the next morning before he went to work. In other words, nobody needed to be the wiser, right? I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Always maintaining integrity? Yeah. So don't worry about it. I mean, nobody's going to know. And I mean, you just assume since it was in that car, it just, you know, with Proctor, who's so very well, uh, I mean, he is just believable. Anything that he says is 100%. So don't worry about your badge. But most importantly, 
don't even give it a second thought because there's no need for you to say anything. It doesn't matter that you lost it because you didn't even remember that you lost it. So why bother, right? I mean, I know that I'm sounding like a little bit of a ass about it, but quite frankly, what rules and who gets to pick what rules you get to bend, stretch, change, read a different way? I'm just a little curious on that. Who makes all this shit up? Who says you can or can't do what you did or didn't do? And why should you worry what they said? Because it's no consequence to you. It's non-consequential for you because you're not, you, you don't face consequences. I mean, you're the good old boys, right? You're the Canton PD. You look after each other. You don't let anything bring you down. Not even a Boston police officer, I bet. I can't wait till this is this entire case. I hope they blow y'all so far out the water because y'all think y'all are just above it all. I hope Levy has so much stuff on y'all that you're going to just be ill when they even start with the first word. Because y'all right now think you're getting away with everything. All right, Gallagher's interview. Gallagher was asked during his interview whether Albert reported his badge missing. He confirmed that he did not report the badge as missing or lost. Gallagher also mentioned that based on his experience, a badge left in an unmarked police cruiser overnight would not typically be considered lost. Yeah. No, it's not like he could have been called in on an emergency either because he was too drunk by then. And uh, he wouldn't have been able to find his badge. So he wouldn't have to worry about going. He noted that officers often remove their badge belt clips for comfort while seated and would not generally consider such an action as a loss or misplacement. So, I mean, you know, don't worry about whose cruiser you leave it in. It's it's all right. It's all right. It, it, even if you don't talk to that person ever, it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Common practices. Based on common practices within the field, within the police field, it is not unusual for detectives to remove their badge belts, clips and place them in the console, glove box, or door pocket of their assigned cruiser or personal vehicle. Considering the statements from Gallagher and Albert, I do not believe that his actions constitutes a violation of the relevant rule or regulations. Considering Albert's explanation, Gallagher's testimony, and common police practices, I do not believe that Albert's actions constitute a violation of Rule 12.12. .12. Karen Security of Firearms. On July 20th, 2022, a series of text messages between Albert and Proctor raised concerns about the possible violation of Canton Police Department Rule 12.4 regarding the care and security of the firearms. The text exchange including the following. Proctor, found your badge this morning. Oh, let me start again. Proctor, found your badge in my cruiser this morning. I can leave it in my locker at the gym, drop it off at your station, or leave it in my mailbox. Albert said, my mailbox. Did I take my gun? Followed by a wincing face emoji. My mailbox. Did I take my gun? 
And Proctor says, ha ha, what's your address? I'll drop it off after the gym. Ultimately, Proctor delivered the badge to Albert at the Canton Police Department. This exchange prompted concerns about Rule 12.14, which states, Officers shall maintain their firearms service in proper working order at all times or report any damage, loss, or unserviceable condition immediately to the chief of police or to their commanding officer. All officers shall be personally responsible for the security and safekeeping of said firearms at all times and shall not alter or repair or part of their firearm service without approval of the chief of police. While on or off duty, officers shall only carry their service firearms in a safety holster issued or approved by the chief of police. Officers shall not use or handle weapons or firearms in a careless or imprudent manner. Albert explanation. Albert explains that he typically removes both his firearm and badge during meals due to their cumbersome nature. He noted that Proctor's cruiser was equipped with a safe and a lockable glove compartment. Albert believed he secured the firearm in the glove compartment located directly in front of him. So he he's pretty sure he did. I mean, he didn't say for sure positive, but he's pretty sure he did. Like that one up there where he was positive about something and I mentioned it. Can't remember what it was, but it was trivial. Proctor's state police interview. In his state police interview, Proctor indicated that to the best of his recollection, Albert either secured the firearm and badge in a lockbox or if they didn't fit, locked them in the glove box. Proctor confirmed that the items were secure. Rule 1214 requires that officers be personally responsible for the security and safekeeping of their firearms at all times. This raises the question of if a locked glove compartment inside a locked vehicle meets the security requirements for the firearms. Legal and statutory content. The courts have held that a locked glove compartment might be considered adequate for firearm storage under certain statutes. Additionally, the recent Mass Legislation and Act Modernizing firearms laws provides further clarity. The statute defines secured in a locked container as secured in a container that is capable of being unlocked only by means of a key combination or similar means, including an unoccupied motor vehicle, a locked trunk, not accessible from the passenger compartment or a locked console or locked glove box and for the purposes of common carrier in the course of the regular and ordinary transport of firearms locked access to any area containing firearms given this legislative clarification and the circumstances of this case placing the firearm in the locked glove compartment inside a locked vehicle meets the requirements for secure storage. Therefore, based on the evidence reviewed, I find that rule 12.14 was not violated. Summary. I find that Albert violated the following policies, possession or use of alcohol and conduct, conduct and becoming an officer. I find that Albert did not violate the following policies, criminal conduct, items of identification, carry, and security of firearms. Recommendations. Overtime management. Specialty overtime for detectives, school resource officers, and other designated positions should be entered into the attendance system by a supervisor. Specifically, no individual should be responsible for entering their own overtime. This task should be performed by a person of at least one rank higher than the individual requesting the overtime. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've worked many places, uh, but I've never been allowed to input my own time. 
even when I helped the bookkeeper a few times when she had to be out or something had to be done and she just taught me through how to do it um, never ever ever I mean it's just it's just the look of impropriety you know I mean it's so obvious that these people don't care Oh, an act of modernizing firearm laws, chapter 135 of the acts of 2024. But what were the laws back in 2021 when this occurred? Just curious because possibly, but then again, y'all don't seem to really care. Uh, rules and regulations review. Use this investigation as an opportunity to conduct a comprehensive review of the rules and regulations with the entire department. In-person training sessions should be conducted to ensure through under thorough understanding, followed by the distribu distribution of updated rules, regulations, through a document managed system that requires electronic signatures from all personnel. Detective Kevin Albert. The, I, I just have to read these because <laughs> she cracks me up like she's hot business, right? Like, I mean, we hear about her all the time. You don't see her. doesn't have anything to do with anything. But hey, lady. I'm writing you to memorialize our in-person conversation that took place on 6-13-24 in my office. During which time you were placed on administrative leave your union representative, Tim Taylor, and Deputy Chief Cheryl were present at this meeting. Ooh, look, y'all, my coloring. I'm getting tired of sitting here. Can you tell? It's like, whoop, whoop. You will remain on administrative leave with pay pending the outcome of internal investigation administrative leave with pay he gets to be paid while they check to see if he broke any laws and uh he had a couple of vacays going on i bet so they had to kind of stretch it around no i'm just kidding i don't know all right outcome of internal investigation of an alleged incident involving the misplacement of your duty weapon and badge this investigation aims to determine whether any rules regulations policies or procedures of cpd were violated at the conclusion of the 6 13 24 meeting it is agreed that you turned over your firearm badge and id to the dc cheryl for the duration of this leave to maintain the integrity of the investigation i must insist that you refrain from discussing this matter with anyone except for your legal representatives until the investigation is concluded you will receive notification regarding the time and location of your employee interview thank you for your cooperation Woohoo! Oh, and another one from Helena on June 18th. Man, she's busy. I bet this is the most she worked all week. As you're aware, the department is currently conducting an internal investigation regarding the alleged misplacement of your firearm and badge. This investigation will determine whether any rules, regulations, policies, or procedures of the CPD were violated. To ensure a fair and impartial investigation, we have opted to engage outside investigator. We have hired attorney Terrence M. Delahante of Winthrop, Mass. to perform the investigation. Does anybody know anything about this person? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, do you? Attorney Delahante will be contacting you directly or your union attorney, Jennifer Smith, whose information has been provided to him. Your cooperation with Attorney Delahante is crucial 
and appreciated. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Attorney Delahante or myself, Helena Rafferty. Mm -hmm. Oh, where's most I've seen of Helena? Detective Albert, this letter serves as an official directive to preserve all records, whether in physical or electronic format including those on personal or work devices pertaining to any communication between Trooper Michael Proctor and yourself. As per our rules and regulations, your cooperation with the Internal Affairs Investigation necessitates the preservation of documents, phone records, text messages, voicemails, emails, or any communication via applications. This order strictly prohibits alterations or destruction of any such data applying equally to physical documents and electronic data with the same gravity as other forms of evidence. The purpose of this directive is to ensure compliance with the obligations to safeguard relevant physical and electronic evidence pending the resolution of the internal investigation. Specifically, I request that you immediately gather and secure store relevant items or objects immediately. Just a second. Let me wet my whistle. Mercy is taking longer than I thought. But I just wanted to knock it out. I mean, it's going to be under two hours, so where was I? Cease routine destruction. <laughs> Cease routine destruction of physical and electronic documents and files relevant to this investigation. Stop it right now. Just stop. Suspend. E I think that's supposed to be erase or purging. Oh, suspend erasing or purging of electronically stored data or segregate potentially relevant information. Stop it right now. Just stop it. I mean, y'all, y'all, y'all took care of this a while back because, um, once you found out that that little bit was, uh, was available to the feds from Proctor. I bet y'all did a lot of cleaning out your phones. So you don't have to worry about it. That would have been done long before that, right? I bet it was. Because y'all knew. Everything that Lally knew, y'all knew. No question asked. All right. Suspend. Obtain and maintain identity and contact information from potential witnesses. Refrain from handling or testing physical evidence in a manner that could alter its integrity and affect future testing. Your prompt attention to these preservation measures is crucial. Please acknowledge receipt of this letter at your earliest convenience. Elena Rafferty. Exhibit for another letter from Helena, July 8th. Detective Albert, as part of the ongoing investigation, can you please provide records of communication such as calls, Facebook messages, Instagram messages, text messages, emails, or other exchanges on third party messaging apps between yourself and Trooper Proctor during July 2022? Helena Rafferty. And then what we have here just shows, I'm just going to show you, there's, there's his schedule. It's all blacked out, and I'm not going to do all that. So I'm just going to show you that this is a 200-page report. I've read the pertinent information now it's just all the exhibits
that's all about wages this is all about shift coverage and how you get paid for it overtime right overtime work out of grade that means if you're working as a detective and you're only a sergeant they would pay you the difference between sergeant and detective i guess i don't know big deal the shift differential glad to see it's the same as regular regular common folks promotion list weekend differential special events paid details there you go longevity how long are you gonna stay i mean if anybody's just wanted to stay for what there was to hear y'all have heard it so i'm just showing this so that you see all the pages <laughs> i mean this is just this is not case specific this is just providing a bunch of crap so that it's just all in the way <laughs> You know, it looks like a whole lot went into this, right? Because after all, it's 200 pages. But um, don't think so. Don't think so. I thought somebody was in here for a minute. See, so we're up to page 85. Yes, see, we're still looking at money. Oh, and look at this. Look at this. This is for the can police association and the select board the above papers were now I like this policies and procedures internal affairs ready chief of police issuing authority effective date 10 1 of 2012 review date 1 15 of 2022 Okay. Effective date 2012. We had a revision 2014, 2015, 2016, 2018, and 2020. Not very much, right? There we go. So these are just to show you Canton's uh, police department's internal affairs policy. I mean, that, you know, whole thing in here. So we're covered, covered, covered. Now we have the rules and regulations for the Canton Police Department. Now, this was final draft was in 2000. Remember that. The rules and regulations for the Canton Police Department. Two thousand. This was written in two thousand, and they haven't had a need to update this at all. There's table of contents and just all kinds, see? And I believe uh, for the government of the police department of the town of Canton, rules and regulations, and this is for the chief of police to sign, right? And then signature of officer that gets it, signature of issuing officer, whatever. And they sign that they got it. So that's, um, you know, that's really good. That's been around since the year 2000. I mean, we haven't made progress in anything. So why, uh, why would anyone need to, um, why would anybody need to do anything with this, right? I mean, that's all this is right here, guys. That's it. We're just going to put it in here so that people will have a record of, this massive thing that's in place that's been in place since the year 2000. All right, this is interesting. So 
I, I think I said it before when they originally talked to him. Well, it's in the beginning, I believe, that when they originally talked to one of them, they had forgotten one of the stops. So that was kind of funny. I mean, but yet they can remember specific things like putting their gun in a glove box or so-and-so putting it in, whatever. All right, so Detective Albert, on August 14th, you had an interview with attorney Terrence Delahante. As a follow-up, we kindly request that you provide any credit card or debit card transaction information made on July 19th, 2022, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 2 a.m. Please forward these records to Attorney Delahanty at your earliest convenience. Now, notice they spoke about it on the 14th. She wrote this on the 19th. So, I don't guess he was in too big a hurry, right? Woo. General law. General law. Yeah, this is just general law. <laughs> there you go, folks. There you go. Just some more. We got a bunch of bunch of paper fillers here. And there you go. That's it. So folks, best thing to know is um well, I guess that they're they they can claim that they spoke to more people, but um they they looked at the transcripts of Proctor and they talked to Albert and they talked to Gallagher. I want y'all to think about how thorough that investigation was. It was so thorough that they used the 2024 firearm, whatever. Although this happened in 2021. So there was something prior to this in place, but they didn't go over that. But it really doesn't matter, does it? I mean, <laughs> do we think that he's only done this once? No. I think they have a lot of good old boy happening. They just do what they want when they want, how they want. That's what I think. Look at this mess right there. So. That's it for right now. I'm doing laundry and trying to finish organizing this room. I've got a bunch of shirts I want to make. And I want to make some coffee cups. So, um, I'm going to say bye for now. I think that the next thing I'm going to do is uh, read. Uh, yeah, we're going to do um, Better Row. We're going to see what Better Row's letter was. You know, uh, Turtle Boy's attorney. Yeah. Yeah, I got that one too. So we're going to share it and then I'll go backwards on Turtle Boy and Karen Reed. So I just have to figure which one's which. All right, we'll see y'all. Y'all have a great day. Bye.